invisible loss is almost like an emotional punch. You know, when you go about your day and your life um, and something happens that's completely unexpected, someone may be insulting you in a, in a meeting at work, someone saying something to you publicly that doesn't, it's not great and you feel ashamed and you kind of shrivel a little bit yeah. and you don't say anything about it to anyone because we've been told not to complain and not to share these seemingly small events because we should be so grateful we have look at the great life that we have you we hear that all the time that moment of shame that moment of embarrassment and i will give you other examples to that moment of this horrible feeling comes in you shift the perception of yourself to a person that is not worthy it is not you're not good enough you're not worthy of something better and the survivor self in your mind the fear center to this was all based by the way uh, by brain brain science i brought the whole the whole thing is is every step of the way is based on something that our brain does your fear center is basically activated in that moment in time and you're worrying and doubting yourself so you can keep yourself small enough never to raise your hand in that meeting again so it doesn't happen again so you right. become smaller and smaller and that invisible loss kind of continues and keeps you in that stuck place so embarrassed at a meeting at a work meeting um let's say you're growing up with a parent whether it's a mother or a father that kind of never really looked you in the eye but you didn't understand that you just this is your parent. This is your mother or father, let's say. And they're always dismissive when they talk to you. They move fast. They never kind of stop, sit down and pay attention to you. And that invisible loss. And I've heard different versions of that from early childhood from people. That invisible loss is that you're not worthy of the attention of your parent, that there's no contact you're not being seen. And then as a child, you don't have the words to uh, express how you feel. You don't know what this is about. You have a strange feeling, but you don't understand it. And then you grow up believing that you're not worthy of that connection with, you're not worthy of love. And you end up could end up in relationships that you always have to work hard to get that attention that you your survivor self will say am i good enough for them am i what should i do what should i change should i change my hair color should i dress differently would that be better and most of those thoughts happen complete completely unconsciously actually unless we're doing the yeah. cleanse and we're right and we're doing the mental stack there are the, there's a story in the book i talk about an immigrant um that moves with her family to the United States and um, she has been raised to be very grateful for the sacrifices her parents have made for her. So she spends her whole life in a career based on what they thought was good for her because they yeah. made the sacrifice to come to this country for her education. So she had dedicated her whole life and she had a PhD. She, she was great. She did great. This, this is not about success. It's about the right type of success on the right type of path for you. Um, and her invisible loss was that she couldn't ever tell anyone that she wasn't happy because she should be grateful for the sacrifices her parents had made. There's an exercise in the book. Uh, there's two exercises. One is how to discover your um, early primary invisible loss, something that happened really early on. Um, and another one is to find one that you're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis because uh, they are different. One is stemming from the other, but they're, they're having different side effects and different experiences. Uh, so I ask you questions like, when was the first time you felt disconnected from the world um, and you felt it was you versus them? When was the first time you felt that you were getting reprimanded for expressing who you are? 
And we try to locate those memories. And because there's a reason why I call it invisible. It's not just invisible to others about us. It's invisible to us, Eileen. Yeah. That's the hardest part. Thank you for giving the examples because it makes it more clear. And then also, I'm sure our listeners can... They, they can start to understand like the parts of their lives where this might have happened. It's It can be so subtle. It could be someone just saying like a weird comment that came off a little too offensive or critical, or it could be like major childhood trauma. It could be any of those things, right? But the truth is we lose a little bit of ourselves every single time something like that happens. And you're saying that there is a way to get ourselves back. Yes. And that <laughs> that's the beauty. <laughs> And I can't emphasize that not only can we find the places where we lost parts of ourselves, of our true selves, of that original you. There's an exercise in the in the in the book where I call it the Thriver Bridge, where we actually go back, and that's later in the book. We we ha- a good friend of mine. She got an early copy of the book and <laughs> sent me a text, Christina. You're making me work so hard. I know I need this, but it's a lot of work. And I said, you know, I wish there was another way. I wish there was a shortcut to this. But as you know, Eileen, for all the work you've done on yourself, if if we want to get it right, we got to figure out what we lost, where we lost it, and which way out of the waiting room it is. Because there's many Mm -hmm. exit points. But a lot of those exit points actually bring you right back because they're not right. You you need to really get it right. And I always recommend in the beginning, go slow. Do like, do all the exercises. Try and try and find those moments of impact and ask yourself the questions. Grab a, if you have a friend, if you have a therapist, if you have a friend, if you have a group of people, work with them as well. There's a, in the back of the book, I, um, I'm not, no longer teaching any classes. I just stopped. Um, and I know people assumed that, you know, this will, this book for me is in not replacing the classes, but that's my gift to the world where if you have this book, you can do the work. And at the back, there's a, there's a guide for, uh, for groups as well. So like, I don't need to, I used to, um, trained therapists um, with this model. I believe that the book can absolutely take you by the hand and actually have uh, what I call coffee breaks in the book. (laughs) You can have tea if you want, uh, where it feels like I am with you. I also had my survivor self tell me, how dare I not teach again this work. When you are living from your most authentic self, Eileen, and know you know this very well, the way I was supposed to do my life going forward is never going to be. And people cannot understand the decisions I'm making. They make no sense. <laughs> but for me, it has to be right. Not just right. It has to feel so unbelievable great to say yes to something. And I love teaching. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I love my community. They are the, some of the best people in the world. Like I love teaching this and helping people. There's, there's such a fulfillment. But at the same time, I feel like if I'm living the book, if I'm living the work, if I'm honest with my community and my world around me, if I have to live by example and we teach best when we're living the lesson. This is, this is how people can learn from you is by living the life that not just saying, not just teaching it, not just telling people what to do, but you are living it. And if I'm living mm-hmm. it right, I don't have to teach anything ever again because, because everything is, is, is present that needs to be taught without me having to say much. It's, they, they will, they see it already. I mean, I didn't realize how many people I would inspire by just going back to school. I didn't even tell anyone at the beginning because I was hiding. And I'm like, no, you know, nobody (laughs) should know this, right? And uh, oh my gosh, let's 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 not tell anyone. And then I started telling people, oh my goodness, Eileen, like the way you live your life, like share it as much as much as possible because it's inspiring to so many people. That's how they get to change their life. 
Yeah, so beautiful. Like going through this process is a lot of work, right? Where do you recommend people start? Do you start with the easy stuff, like the small losses, or should you just go for the big stuff? Is there an approach? By the way, I had to write this book three different times, and this is not an exaggeration. And it trying to explain something that has not been explained before. Um, I thought, of course, it's going to be no problem because I, because I, I am the work. I did. I created the work, and I've done it for so long. Uh, it was was difficult because I I wasn't going to be there. I, everything the book had to have everything that it needed. I would start. The book will take you gently. So this is the recommendation I, I say. If you if your brain needs to know what comes next, you can just kind of read through it without doing any of the exercises. If your brain just needs to have an understanding of the landscape, some brains have a need to know what happens next, where we go next before they get there. So do that. My advice would be grab a journal, grab a pen, or if you are, if you're used to writing on your phone, if, whatever is easiest for you, a highlighter and take your time and do those exercises. And it starts with, um, with a questionnaire with a few questions and those questions get points that kind of you are being asked the same questions in the end and you'll see, you actually will see your, your re-entry levels. You, you'll see how much you've changed. For me, just buying the book is not enough. I want everyone to kind of commit to doing the work and to taking their time with it. And then what happens is you will want a family member or a friend to see their own invisible losses. And then you start talking about them to others and then you're changing someone else's life. And and just even have, even just, you know what, if, if all you can do is just read the first couple of chapters just to have an understanding and just ask your own questions, that's okay too. Don't give yourself a hard time. And if you need to take a break and go back to it, do that as well. When we were doing all the classes, it's always gonna be a judgment-free place. It's about learning to be honest with yourself to begin with and asking yourself the tough questions and being, being okay with the answers. It's a complicated process, but it's funny because most people at the end of it, they say, gosh, this is so simple. It's almost natural because we are actually kind of made to get back up again and reenter life. We're made to find a way out of the stuckness and the loop that we're in. We have the abilities and skills. And at the end of the day, all I want people to do is spend only 10 to 15 minutes a day doing a mental stack. The homework kind of shrinks as you go forward. And it's just a stack of thoughts that you are putting yourself back in control of your mind. Imagine if you took 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes a day, you can change your whole entire life. That's all. That's all you need. You don't need any pills. You don't need any, you know, and I'm, I have no people, prescription medication can save lives. But imagine if you just gave 10, 15 minutes a day. <laughs> 